Good morning to everyone. Going to have you stand as we get ready to sing some worship this morning. Um, let you know that where the countdown left off this morning, if you, I don't know if you heard it or not, but hallelujah, praise Jehovah, we're going to just go ahead and sing that now, okay? If that's all right. Oh, I knew I was going to do that. I told those guys up there, you guys need to be seated. We've got a video. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm just too well trained about getting up here when that's at zero. Let's stand, please, as we sing this song now. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. And I hope, I hope some of the songs might make it easy for you to imagine this morning what it might have been like to be on the streets or, or in the procession or whatever as we sing some of these this morning. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye Yeah. 
this version of Holy, Holy, Holy will start off with um, sopranos and then add altos, then tenors, then basses. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. So good to see all of you today on this beautiful Palm Sunday. Uh, just welcome to everyone. If you are a visitor with us watching online, so glad that you're here with us today. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, either if you're in person, please fill out a card uh, in the row in front of you and then turn that in to me at the end and I have a gift for you. If you're online, please send an email to southhillschurchofchrist at gmail.com and let us know that you were watching today. Also, if you have a prayer request, uh, please fill out the card that's also in the seat in front of you. Uh, your praise, your prayer request, your petition to God, and turn those into the offering basket at the end. And also, if you're online, southhillspraise at gmail.com. We gather uh, Mondays at 5 p.m. to pray over those and then continue praying throughout the week. A couple of announcements. Uh, starting to get more information on the men's retreat, 31st annual. Uh, that's held up in Augusta. It'll be May 13th through the 15th this year. It is on. Uh, we have a guest speaker from Harding coming, uh, Charles Gupton. So it should be a great time of transformation. Hopefully I will have a brochure or something with a little more information on it soon because there's no way you can read that up there. So just trust me, the 13th and the 15th is really what you need to know at this point. Uh, and a reminder, this Thursday, as we prepare for Good Friday, uh, we have a day of prayer here in the building. We'll set this up with different prayer stations. Uh, it'll be just a really beautiful time to come, have some quiet time uh, with God prayer and uh, just thinking of him and lifting him up as we think about Jesus and his sacrifice. So that'll be April 1st, 9 to 6. Just come whenever you have time and enjoy that. Uh, the ladies' tea, just a reminder that RSPPs are due on the 29th to South Hills Church of Christ at gmail.com, to Diane specifically, or you can reach out to Annette uh, or one of the other ladies who's helping out with that. But we do need to know, um, as of now, there's five RSVPs, and I know there's more ladies that are interested. So please, let them know so they can plan uh, the food and the tea. Uh, also, men's group, we've chosen a group, uh, a book for the group. We're going to go through Souls in Transition. So it's written by an auth author, Christian Smith. He originally did a study and wrote about uh, high schoolers and junior hires who were struggling and leaving their faith. And now this is his follow-up volume that has to do with millennials and Gen Z specifically and what they're thinking um, about God, especially about Christianity and about the church. So we're really excited to start going through that. Uh, so if you want to join us, we're going to begin on April 13th. Uh, Lance Love will be with us as well that day for our study. And it starts at 7 a.m. Um, come and enjoy some time as we, you know, wrestle with how do we keep so many young people just exiting that back door and not coming back again. It's such an important topic, so I hope all the guys will be there. Uh, lastly, uh, just a reminder that uh, Good Friday service, hopefully you saw the back of the paper today. We got almost the whole page to ourselves advertising our Easter and Good Friday services. So... Really looking forward to that. Good Friday is this Friday at 7 p.m. here. It'll be a, a short, uh, kid-friendly, probably about an hour, just a lot of time of worship and thinking about the crucifixion and all that Jesus went through. Then Easter Sunday, we'll have a fellowship set up downstairs with continental breakfast and coffee, and then the resurrection celebration at 1030. Please uh, invite a friend. We are going to set up the auditorium where there'll be plenty of room and still social distance, and we'll also have an overflow downstairs if God sends us 200 people. So that would be wonderful. All right, at this time, Terry's going to come up and lead us in a pastoral prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Jehovah, our God, we're so thankful to call you our Father and to realize abundance of blessings as your children and pray father that we'll always be uh, always recognize what a uh, what great privilege we have when it comes to material blessings of this world and yet in many ways father we're we're thirsty in the rain considering your children in other parts of the world that don't have anywhere near as much in the way of material blessings and yet we who have that in such great abundance uh, struggle to be happy and to embrace joy 
and especially in light of the circumstances over the last year, Father, um, we're struggling relationally in so many ways. Uh, there have been some who actually have, have found uh, this last year to be a blessing because it's, it's drawn family members together more closely physically, sheltering in place, and yet for most of us, we've been separated from family members and from, and from friends, and our church family's been separated. And so, Father, we pray that you'll help us as we uh, begin to heal um, relationally, and come out of our relational poverty, um, starting with our relationship with you, Father, Pray that we'll be ever mindful of what it is that we can and should be doing to look to you uh, for guidance and to focus on what's in front of us and not worry about the things that are beyond our control. And Father, we pray that we will minister to one another, that we'll look to Jesus', Jesus example of what it is to love one another and that we'll love our, our fellow brothers and sisters and that... Uh, we might be a light to those um, who are in this community who are struggling on so many different levels and what is it that we can do to, to minister to them and to be effective uh, individually and collectively in, in sharing uh, the joy uh, that's available through you and focusing on eternity rather than the uh, ephemeral things of this life. Father, there's a, there's a number in our church family who are struggling with, with illness and, and family members who are uh, struggling, struggling to minister to them and take care of them. And we pray, Father, that uh, you will give them the strength to, uh, to minister to, to their family members uh, during this time of, of illness. And we pray, Father, uh, your healing hand we pray for uh, the many events that we have coming up here at South Hills Church, and uh, especially pray for Lance and Dory as they prepare to come out uh, to look at the prospect of joining uh, the work here at South Hills. Um, we pray, Father, that in all things that we will look to Jesus as our example in our, in our walk, and it's in his precious name we pray. Imagine that there will be a time for us to stand in the presence of Jesus and say, Blessed are you, O Son of God. Father in heaven, how we love you.
Occasionally, when attempting to make a good point, you have to start in an unexpected place. Two years ago, August 15th, 2019, marked the 50th anniversary of what event? Yes, whoever said that? Yes, yeah, got it. Woodstock, the Woodstock Music and Arts Festival in Bethel, New York. Most people are aware of the event by just the abbreviated name Woodstock. Approximately 500,000 mostly young people camped out on a 600-acre dairy farm to hear 32 musical acts play over the course of four days. The festival became widely regarded as a pivotal moment in popular music history, as well as a defining moment of the countercultural generation. In 2017, the festival site was listed on the U.S. Register of Historic Places. Most of the leading or emerging rock and roll and pop performers of the era were there, except for one prominent singer-songwriter of the day. Joni Mitchell was unable to make it to the music festival due to a scheduled television uh, performance uh, on the Dick Cavett Show. So Joni composed her famous theme song, Woodstock in a New York City hotel based upon information from her boyfriend, Graham Nash, at the time, and from what she saw in televised reports about the music festival. The song Woodstock, released on September 13, 1969, was the vinyl B-side to Joni's hit single, Big Yellow Taxi. Now, just as an aside here, for you younger people, especially here today, your grandparents used to buy music on black plastic discs with one song on each side. And I guess vinyl records are enjoying a, a resurgence because the sound quality is better than digitized music. Anyway, probably the best known version of Woodstock is the one performed by Crosby, Stills, and Nash in 1969. Okay, saying all of that is not my attempt to impart spiritual, biblical, or theological significance to the Woodstock Music Festival of some 50 years ago. That was just the unexpected starting point I mentioned earlier to make you wonder where this line of thought could be heading. But the four-day concert was held near Bethel, New York. Bethel meaning house of God. Now, that's probably just a coincidence. Um, but Joni's Woodstock tribute song does contain several deliberate sacred references. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. The song narrates a saga about a child of God on a spiritual journey along with other young people hoping to use the power of music to peacefully reunite humanity into the sort of tranquility that existed in the Garden of Eden. And even though Joni wrote the song in New York City, it isn't Madison Square Garden that she's referring to in the song. It's Eden itself that's envisioned. And here's something important that I think we can use this song to remind us of. Next slide. In the late 1960s, I was a high schooler in Kansas City. And I can remember a big section of downtown KC being an inferno due to the dreadful inner city race riots of that time. Protests over the Vietnam War and racial injustice turned Chicago, Atlanta, Philadelphia, LA, San Francisco, and many other locations around our country, including a lot of college campuses, into widespread scenes of mob violence, riots, and civil unrest, unlike anything our country had really ever seen. 
the violence in Seattle last year, due to the protests of George Floyd's death, pales in comparison to the extent of what happened all across America in the late 1960s. And yet, back in that extremely contentious time, approximately a half a million young people from everywhere across the country camped out together and lived in close quarters for several days, almost without incident. Despite a nearly total absence of security, there were only something like 12 police officers to control the crowds. There was little violence, and most injuries were minor cuts and scrapes, most of which were attributed to concert goers going around barefooted. Volunteers manning the medical tent saw mostly food poisoning and a few bad trips. And remarkably, only two people died, one from a drug overdose that was probably the misuse of insulin rather than LSD, and a teenager who unfortunately fell asleep in front of a tractor wheel and then ended up crushed to death. Very likely, Woodstock was an anomaly, a brief, much-needed respite from a world fraught with violence and discord. Maybe not all that different from the times we live in today. Still, knowing that a multitude of young people managed to coexist peacefully for several days under sometimes deplorable conditions because of rain and mud, maybe that can give us a little hope that we can also weather today's stormy times. I actually think that if Jesus had been around at the time, he might have attended Woodstock. It was just the sort of thing he was always accused of, you know, enjoying eating and drinking and the companionship of all the wrong people. And perhaps the musical sounds of Woodstock even occasionally emanate from the heavenly throne room. You know, after continuous church hymns become a little wearisome. And last slide. The primary lesson from my Woodstock illustration is that it shows the power of a decent common cause Young people from everywhere temporarily united together in peace to listen to music. Similarly, Jesus has asked all of his followers to collectively unite in remembering him until he returns. For a few moments, we are to put aside all of the ordinary pressures and differences that normally divide us and participate together in a very simple, symbolic meal designed to remind us of our Savior until the time that we, we are reunited with him again. Status, age, birthplace, sex, race, political outlooks, and all other seemingly important matters are inconsequential to Christians all across the world, remembering the only thing that does matter. God's son who willingly obeyed his father's wishes and sacrificed himself, thus destroying the power of death itself. You know, peace doesn't come from Flowers, long hair, funky music, and bell-bottom pants. <laughs> Even if there was a time when it was kind of fun to believe that. The Apostle Peter was correct when he said, Peace is for all of you who are in Christ. Jesus is the world's true source of peace. Let's pray together. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you in this moment of remembering your Son, particularly. We ask that you would bless this bread that we partake of in remembering his body that was sacrificed on the cross. And may we take it in a pleasing manner. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Again, Father, we ask that you bless this cup, which reminds us of Jesus' blood that was spilled in his sacrifice on the cross and that cleanses us from our sins. Bless each of us, Father. Help us to be thankful and to be pleasing in your sight. We ask through your son, Jesus. Amen. Hi there. So, this is with the offering. So, if you're not from around here, it's in the back. Uh, we do online too, and in the day of age with no checks anymore and stuff. So, you can either do it through your bank maybe or just go online and check it out. So, the offering, which reminds me of the stimulus, which is, you know, the big talk, which is kind of nice getting extra money that I didn't do anything for, right? Which reminded me of another thing. We had a thread, and if you know what Teams is, Microsoft Teams, it's what we use at work now to talk with, and uh, somebody poses a question of the day, and he said, if you won the, mil the lottery, you know, what would you do? Which then reminded me of a conversation I was listening to on the radio of a gal was talking about that same thing, that uh, when you get a sudden, uh, you know, a large amount of wealth, that, and you, you know, have only been used to pay to paycheck to paycheck, what are you going to do with that? Uh, playing the lottery is great, but you got to actually pay to play and then usually donate your funds to somebody else to win, so it's kind of a losing deal there. So, as I said, as appealing as that sounds, uh, when you think you have all you've ever wanted, the money that you, you've dreamed of and all the things you're going to do with it, it's so easy to take your eyes off the Lord and think that you're the God now and forget where your provision comes from, who gave you that money in the first place. And when you're not relying on God's provision, that separates you, which then reminded me of another story. And I don't know if, how, many, how many historian buffs are in here, but back in the 1800s when the uh, Copper Kings were kind of, you know, going at it, there was an election going on, and Clark and Daly, you know, Clark was trying to get in and sending all his money to everybody to vote for him, and Daly spending all his money telling everybody not to vote for him, right? And so that went on and on, and Clark ends up getting winning the, you know, the election, and Daly, kind of behind the scenes type deal, his kind of a triumph thing for him was he ended up selling his share to Rockefeller for something like 39 million. You can imagine how much that was back then, right? Well, then a year later, he ends up getting sick and dies, right? So all that money didn't really, couldn't do anything for him, which then reminds me of Jesus who died and walked out of the grave on his own as an offering for us. Let us pray. Holy Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Since Mark revealed his age this morning, I feel like I need to. 
a, a real quick comment that uh, a, a member of my high school class was our representative to Woodstock that year. He even got his picture taken in one of the one of the rainy pictures. <laughs> anyway, let's stand together as we sing this song. <clears throat> Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God. Let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah. Sing aloud to God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Be seated, please. That is the perfect song. For Palm Sunday. Thanks, Tom. Welcome again, everybody. My name is Scott Falkowski. I'm the preaching minister here at South Hills Church of Christ, and it's so good to see everyone today on this special day that I know I've been anticipating for months, and uh, it's quite the week within Christendom to study about, the last week of Jesus' life. And we are going to spend some time talking about Palm Sunday today in a, what may be a familiar passage from John chapter 12. But I want to start today by way of an illustration. So Glenda, I hope you're watching, my fellow movie buff. I don't know if you've seen uh, this movie called News of the World that came out about four months ago, but uh, just came to DVD uh, this past Tuesday, starring Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks is a former Civil War veteran, Captain Jefferson Kyle Kidd, and he travels through post-Civil War Texas reading the newspaper. That's what he does. He goes from mining town to cattle town to oil town, and he pulls out newspapers that are local news, world news, and he just picks a story and he reads it. And the movie really draws us into that setting, something that I personally can't comprehend, especially in this day and age of Google and Yahoo News and all that, where you can get our news at our fingertips. And so you, you watch the people who are thirsting to hear about a world outside of their smaller world. You gotta remember, these are people, and thanks Cody, because we talked about this, these are people who used to look forward to the Sears and Roebuck catalog as the exciting point to their day and their week because of the news and the information 
and the goods that were in there. And that's where you're transported to. I am so sorry. I don't know what's going on today. We'll try that. I get, I'm going to stop breathing right now. Yes. I don't know. It's way down low, Tom. I can't get... The people can't hear me if I go lower. Oh, well. All right, so this is a time, you know, when the biggest news came in the mail like this. But they didn't have local newspapers. They didn't know what was going on in the city, the big city, Dallas, Fort Worth, or some other town like that. And so he would bring the paper to them and read these stories. And so what does that have to do with today, a Tom Hanks movie? Well, my focus is going to be on news of the kingdom. And that good news that came to Jerusalem in the person of Jesus on Palm Sunday, or as we call it, the triumphal entry. News, that of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, who will bring the news of the kingdom to earth. And so I just want to start off with this, and you set the table for me, Mark, and you didn't even know it. I remember where I was in August of 1969. I was in my terrible twos. Um, so <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to anything that was going on, especially at Woodstock or something about going to the moon. Although Annette was three and she still says, oh yeah, I remember watching that on TV and I, I can't even comprehend that. You do, yeah. I'm not making it up. So, I mean, just some major headlines, that, you know, of more recent. You know, a lot of people know exactly where they were and what they were doing and how it impacted them with the assassination of JFK. Or, they that will live in infamy, right? Pearl Harbor being bombed. It's really interesting as I was looking at some of the Pearl Harbor newspapers, and I don't know if you can read that, but it says six known dead. We know it was a lot worse than that. Now that was something that impacted us for quite a long time. Or, more recently, how this changed our country, impacted our lives when the World Trade Center was attacked. But, or the Twin Towers were attacked, but... How about a good one? Anybody remember this one when the miners were saved? That became a movie? Those miners in Chile who were down in a mine trapped for 68 straight days? That was a pretty powerful news. But news, good news and bad news, really can impact our lives. But the greatest news story of all time occurred 2,000 years ago when people shouted, the king is here. It is still the greatest news story, even today. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, the bearer of good news, a good news that, as was already said, death has been conquered. We thank you for your son. We thank you for this day of celebration and anticipation of the events that we know will occur later in the week for Jesus. But we thank you for the reminders of the news that's made available to all of us and that we then can share with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'm just going to read the passage. It's a short passage, and then we'll really dig into it. So John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So he took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the dead and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. 
I mean, it sounds like a familiar story, not just here, but in the book of Acts, other gospels, just the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders. Ah, the frustration they're feeling because Jesus, he's the king, and they don't want to admit it. And so in verse 12 and 13, there's a few very important things that are popping up there that we need to pay attention to. We sang, shout hallelujah, but how about shout hosanna, which means save us. So this crowd that gathers, and this, there's going to be multiple crowds here in John 12 and beyond. And so this crowd is probably pilgrims, many of them probably from the region of Galilee. Just as a reminder, during this time of year, Jerusalem would swell from about 30,000 to 100,000 people. And so people would come from all over because it was their duty, their job, their joy to come and worship in Jerusalem. And so these pilgrims maybe even know a little bit about Jesus. Maybe they've heard of him. Maybe they know of all the miracles that he's done. They have hope wrapped up in him, and they're going to take advantage of that in this scene. So they took these palm branches, and John is the only one that brings palm branches into our discussion where we get Palm Sunday from. And so palm branches usually mean royalty, honor of royalty. In Revolution, Revelation 7, 9, those who are worshiping at the throne of God are using palm branches in their worship. It was very important to them. It was very symbolic. Palm branches for a king. And Jesus doesn't stop their language. He knows who he is. He knows that most of them don't get it yet, including his own disciples. But he lets it go. He lets it happen because it is true. He is the one who can save them. He is the king. He is the one who comes in the name of Israel. Save us, they cried. Save me, I cried. This reminds me of a very, very famous picture that was taken in Montana. How many of you have seen this before? It's one of my favorite wildlife pictures of all time. This was in a fire that happened over in the Bitterroots a couple years ago, 2020, um, or t sorry, 2000, 20 years ago. And so I just see this picture, and it, it causes me to think beyond just a couple of elk watering and maybe oblivious to what's around them, or maybe you know, instinctively trying to get someplace cooler for protection. I don't know, but I think this illustration is a bit of how we feel about life at times. Probably how those people, those pilgrims, that crowd felt about life at times. They were surrounded, those people back then, by forces that they did not like. The Romans, they had been oppressed. It was moving in on them. Only 40 years later, Thousands of them would be killed and their temple would be destroyed as Rome moved in. And I think for us, it's a visual of what we feel at times in our lives about the forces that are working around us, physical and spiritual forces that are closing in. We want saving. We want to jump into a pool, not just stand on that rocky little water there to be saved. But our culture says, hey, look inside for your salvation. Embrace your personal truth. We medicate with drugs, alcohol, television, and other things. We go on the internet, social media, and we rant and we troll. But people are tired. People are worn down. We feel those forces around us especially the last year. We know within our hearts we can't save ourselves. The truth and the only absolute truth that we have is that we are all sinners, separated from God, but we have hope in the resurrection. Hosanna, save us. Hosanna, save me. And so a little further look into this, some of the language that pops out, like, who who comes in the name of Israel. He is the king of Israel. That is powerful for these people as they're shouting that. And I believe they truly mean this. So the Savior enters Jerusalem, the city of God, not touting his own name and his own fame. He just comes in humbly riding on a donkey. 
but he comes in the name of the Lord, the most powerful name there is. And as we've looked through Genesis and the book of Acts, we've seen misuse of names. I don't know if you remember some of those stories, but in Genesis, in the Tower of Babel, there's a group of individuals who are right, trying to build this tower to reach up to heaven so that people will know their name selfishly, egotistically, pridefully, but none of us even know any of their names now. Or Acts chapter 12, where we see a group of Jewish exorcists come up to a man who's possessed and they say, hey, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Paul, come out of him. And the demons go, um, we know Jesus, we know that name, we know the name of Paul, but we don't know you. And it doesn't end well for them. May I not be a person who misuses the name of God. So Jesus truly comes in the name of the Father, and he is acknowledged as the King of Israel, the righteous King prophesied hundreds of years ago. This has been a long time coming, this particular moment. He is in the line of David, the great king, but a better king than David, a better king than any human king could be. And he comes in the name of the Lord, bearing good news. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Our God reigns, but at first he comes in riding on a donkey. And so that prophecy about a donkey is very important. It comes from Zechariah. Jesus fulfills the prophecy that was written over 500 years before. This passage from Zechariah helps us understand what the people are hoping for when they see Jesus riding in Jerusalem on a donkey. Zechariah 9 promises, Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. Boy, they're yearning for that. He, the one who comes, will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. Imagine their joy. Here comes the king to save us from Roman oppression. And I inserted a couple of words because they're not usually there in the NIV. And if you take direct quote from Zechariah, he is the righteous and the victorious king, although he comes in lowly, seated on a donkey. And then we get some of John's honesty at this situation. I can't imagine being one of his disciples and seeing this. I'm sure they got caught up in this. And they're like, here he comes, here he comes. He's overthrowing Rome. Woohoo! we're going to take over. The people will rise up again. This is going to be wonderful. Here comes the army. But I marvel at John's honesty here. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. I love that honesty. He could have easily written without including that, right? Here are the events that occurred. We knew it all the time. But it serves as a reminder to us, to me, are my eyes open to seeing who Jesus truly is. It is the Holy Spirit that reveals these things. This passage brings me comfort that, yes, sometimes I doubt or don't get it or miss it, even though God may put it right there in front of my face. Even John truly didn't understand it, and he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Do we truly understand the victory that Jesus accomplished at the cross and the resurrection? Brothers and sisters, there is power and hope in that resurrection. And continuing on, I want to jump back a little bit to a passage I didn't read yet, but just some kind of context for what happens at the end of this passage. So going back to verse 9 of John chapter 12, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there. This is a different crowd, a different set of people. These are probably people who are from Jerusalem who are going out to Bethany. So another crowd is attracted to Jesus. Found out that Jesus was there and came. Not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. 
This is truly one of my favorite and obviously one of the most powerful stories in the gospel. If you're not familiar with Lazarus, Lazarus was a really good friend of Jesus. He lived in Bethany. He had sisters, Mary and Martha, and they supported Jesus' ministry. They were part of his disciples. They weren't of the 12, but they definitely were part of the group that would call Jesus their friend. And it says that Jesus truly loved Lazarus. Lazarus came, became ill. Mary and Martha sent for Jesus. Jesus tarried a little bit. He had other things to take care of. And then he headed over, and he found out that Lazarus had been dead for four whole days. It's also got one of my favorite lines in all of Scripture, because Jesus says, all right, roll away the stone. And the people say, you can't do that. He's been dead for four years. He stinketh. And so they do, and all of a sudden, Jesus says, Lazarus, come out, come forth. And Lazarus walks out, and everybody's amazed. We talked about that in a Bible class today, Jerry Shute, didn't we? Being amazed by the resurrection. And here's a story of Lazarus, a man being raised from the dead. Another thing that intrigues me about this story is the, the statement that Jesus wept. And of course he did. He's human. He has a friend who's been suffering, and Mary and Martha have been suffering, and all the other people have been suffering. But I believe Jesus also weeps because he knows that now Lazarus will have to die another physical death. And Lazarus is going to be persecuted like this. There's a lot going on in that story. And so Lazarus, obviously the walking miracle that everybody can see, he was well respected, everybody knew about him, even the Sanhedrin knew of him, and he's walking around, and once again, the Pharisees, ah, oh, this isn't getting us anywhere. We need to kill him and Jesus to stop this momentum. And so that's the story of Lazarus, and so as we look at 17, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the, de from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. The Jewish leaders complain that the whole world has gone after him. That's Jesus' mission, actually, that the whole world would go after him. Not just him, but pointing to God. The church and the kingdom of believers is a lot larger than we understand and can comprehend. It definitely was larger than the Jewish leaders wanted to believe. Here the leaders see their power, their influence waning. It is sad and my heart wrenches to watch the self-destruction of these individuals when salvation is literally right in their face. But if you've ever struggled with a sin like I have, the type of sin where you just feel like you can't defeat it, and there seems like there's no hope, even though the answer is right in front of you, and sometimes you just miss it, and you go back to relying on yourself, when I hear these stories of these religious leaders, my heart should cry for them. My heart should yearn for their salvation, and I should not judge them. For I too am a sinner who misses the mark, but for God so loved the world that he sent his son. But the phrase that really pops out to me in this passage, and it's a simple one, and it's slightly out of context, but I believe the truth is still there. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word, and many people, because they had heard that he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. Because they had heard. If no one says anything, if no one goes out and talks about Jesus, if no one shares about their testimony, if we aren't involved in the community around us, how will they hear? We're going to leave it up to the TV, the radio? Because they have heard. That is the good news. And because they heard, they were open. They were desirous of hearing more. They were longing for something, some news that was greater than themselves. We all know we can't fix 
everything. We definitely can't fix our lost situation. They were craving for it. And because they heard, they went out to see about this sign. And what's interesting, John only uses seven signs in his gospel. He doesn't talk about the dozens and dozens of miracles that were out there. Each of his signs has a purpose. Raising of Lazarus and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They serve as a sign pointing to the power of Jesus, the true king, who's going to conquer the grave. And so, here we have Jesus coming. He comes in on a donkey. How should we expect the truly victorious conquering hero to come in? Riding a Hummer? Suburban? Or if you're a muscle car fan, a Bugatti Veyron? Something that screams, hey, look at me. Look what I just did. Bring your praises on to me. Maybe he comes in in the Pope Mobile. Who knows? But not this king. He doesn't shout, look at me. He shouts, look at my father. Because if you've seen me, you've seen my father. I mean, he is victorious. He could call down armies. He could come in and destroy those Roman Roman troops very easily. But instead he says, nope, look at me, lowly and humble. And so yes, we are to verbally express our love for God and our understanding of Jesus our Savior and what he's done for us. But words without actions, if we don't look it, as Jesus claims of the Jewish leaders, they're just whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside, but not the inside. We need to act as one who loves God and loves Jesus and appreciates all that he's done for us. And so a few verses later, there's one of the more important stories in Scripture where this king, the greatest king, lowers himself to serve. And it's through our service where we have opportunities to share about why we serve and who we serve for. And so in this story, Jesus has all of his friends gathered and he knows it's close to the end because that night he'll be betrayed. And instead of some incredible teaching, he does that. The one thing that sticks out in everybody's minds is that he shocks everyone takes off his robe and washes their feet, throws them all off. Wow, why is the master, why is our savior, why is the guy we just sang as king washing our feet? It's because we're called to be servants. We're called to serve others. We're called to look out for others, look out for our neighbor, make sure that true justice is reigning wherever we can help it. And so three of the famous verses from that story, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Oh, if all things are under his power, here comes the glory. Not the glory we expected, huh? And that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. As John said, they missed it. They didn't understand it till after he was glorified. This would have truly thrown them for a loop. Why is the master, the king, who's about to take over washing our feet? It's because he came as a servant king to serve others. So much so that he gave his life for us. And so in closing, I'm reminded of one of my favorite passages, Isaiah 6. Isaiah is being called out to be the prophet of God, and he has this wonderful vision where he enters the throne room of God, and he explains in Isaiah 6 what that looks like and how overwhelmed he is, not just by the visual, but the fact that he knows he is a sinner. And then God enters the story literally and sends one of the angels to purify Isaiah so that his words that come out are also the words of God. And then it ends with this powerful statement. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? 
And who will go for us? And then Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. The king has come. The king is coming again. Where is he sending you? Let's stand as we sing this song together. Salvation belongs to our God. Then have Don come up and lead us in prayer. <clears throat> Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto Please pray with me. Lord, we give thanks for this season of Easter. We give thanks as we move further into spring. Lord, thank you for the returning of green grass and water and life and the warm weather, especially after such a long, dark winter. Lord, we ask for strength and guidance for those of us that are facing challenges, difficulties, and health issues. And uh, Lord, as always, we give thanks for another day of life in your beautiful creation. Lord, thank you for the blessings in 